Sonic the Hedgehog, a franchise that's near and dear to my heart. Ever since I was a young lad, I would play these games so frequently that my freaking fingers would go numb. Whether it was the Genesis slash Mega Drive era of 2D platforming, the vintage polygons of the 6th generation of consoles, or the intense boost gameplay popularised around the 2010s, if I saw that grinning blue mug, and more often than not, I always know I'm in for a good time. But right now, I'm going too fast. Those times can wait, however, because right now I'm starting from the beginning, way, way back in, I'd like to say the year 2000. This unfortunately wasn't the first Sonic game a young Holmes would play, and that honour would go to Sonic 3, but if memory serves me correct, I first saw it in a combo cartridge with two other Sega games. One was Streets of Rage, a side-scrolling beat-em-up where you sock dudes in the face to the best techno tunes the hardware could allow, I always played as the girl. Another was Revenge of Shinobi, a hack and slash homage to the ninja genre that had you utilise different weapons in unkind terrain, a concept BB Me was so confused by I could only reach the second stage. And the third was Sonic the Hedgehog, a bright and cheery yet equally frustrating 2D platformer with addictively fast gameplay and catchy as heck music. You controlled an angry blue rat and ran to the right through colourful landscapes, busting up goofy robots until you confront their creator in one-on-one -on -one confrontations at the end of each level. This was my jam. I think at the time I was spoiled a little bit by the sequels and their improved graphics and inclusion of other characters and gameplay types, but I would always return to the Hedgehog's game of origin and relive the nostalgia and feelings I experienced as a kid playing that magical cartridge, at least until the city and their annoying collision boxes. If you're a fan of my comic reviews, first off, hi there. Second, this video might be a little more informative than my usual format, so just a heads up. As the first in a series, I'll be going into detail on the first Sonic game's history, gameplay and story, as well as my thoughts on the game's graphics and a general feel. Yep, we're getting all introspective here. For this video, I'm using footage from the 2023 re-release in Sonic Origins, but I'll make sure to show the original and any previous ports over the years. Old iterations deserve love too. Ah! Now to start analysing every single aspect and narrate in depth its history and development cycle. Buckle up ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between, because this is how the first Sonic game came to be. It's important to note that in the late 1980s, Sega wasn't in the most favourable position as a games company. Their biggest competitor, Nintendo, were ranking in the big bucks with flagship video titles such as Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, Donkey Kong, Metroid and Kid Icarus. Their games console at the time, the Sega Mega Drive, wasn't the success that they were hoping for both in Japan and overseas. This was despite it being technically superior to the Nintendo Entertainment System, which had swept most of the gaming landscape, excluding Europe. Their arcade ports weren't selling too well, although Flicky, a quaint bird guiding game set to a cheerful catchy tune, was generally well received. And their mascot at the time, a little dude named Alex Kidd, wasn't quite as marketable a character as they initially believed, a sour reputation that would unfortunately follow the icon even a decade later. So they hit rock bottom, what the heck are they gonna do? Eventually, everyone at Sega would have to put their heads together and come up with something that could blow everyone's socks off. Sega of Japan even got everyone in the competitive spirit and began an in-house competition, all to create the perfect flagship character that could stand his ground and totally own the Nintendo-dominated gaming market. They had to step up their game and, well, make a new game. <laughs> Not one with Alex Kidd though, that guy sucked and already had a similar stature to Mario anyway, so he wouldn't do. They had to think more original. Sega president at the time, Heio Nakayama, insisted that this character be as visually iconic as Mickey Mouse, so he had to look akin to his 80s slightly rubber hose style. But the inspiration proved fruitful, and the character was going to be something grand, something to contrast the likes of Mario's simplistic personality, at the time I must stress. And that something went through a whole lot of design ideas, to put it lightly. Come 1990, the team of seven members, including Naoto Oshima, a designer who worked on Fantasy Star, a mildly popular RPG series, and Yuji Naka, a longtime programmer at Sega. This whole group would later be christened as Sonic Team, and together they were dead set on making a 2D platformer. 
The game engine was being developed, and the mascot character was thought to either be a wolf, a bulldog, a type of vague warrior character, a human with pyjamas and a huge moustache, or a robot. But Naoto Oshima would soon chip in with the vague concept of a game. Boom! Twin stars! Two brothers protecting the dream world from nightmares and this ominous villain dude named Thirteen. Sounds about right for an aspiring video game in the 90s. And this whimsical setting and Oshima's endearing style would carry on some aesthetic choices, such as the loop-de-loops, the concept of dreamlike dimensions, and the player character incorporating speed in their movement. That's the key word here, speed. The team were prompted by Sega to consider animals that were fast, and then animals that were capable of rolling into a pool as a form of attack. One of these early ones was a rabbit character that could grab stuff with his long ears, but for Naka, that proved to be too technologically complex for the game's current hardware. While there was talk of animal inspirations such as a kangaroo, a squirrel, or even an armadillo, ultimately, Oshima's decision on a hedgehog was favoured the most. Look at him. <laughs> this spiky boy design, initially nicknamed Mr. Hedgehog, was visualised by combining Felix the Cat's head with Mickey Mouse's body, with the red and white coloration inspired by Santa Claus, and the shoes inspired by Michael Jackson's boots, uh, specifically those on the album cover for Bad. His personality was supposedly inspired by the US President at the time, Bill Clinton, for his determined uh, get it done personality, and thankfully not the other thing. From his very conception, Sonic was influenced by pop culture, both those of the 80s and the then current time period. The colour blue was also used after a couple of palette tests, uh, seeing how he'd best stand out against the game's backgrounds. And one of Sonic's traits would be that he couldn't swim due to Yuji Naka having a wrong assumption that hedgehogs would drop like bricks if they entered water. The world around Sonic would develop alongside the hedgehog, Oshima designing other ideas for enemies, a love interest named Madonna, who would be scrapped for being too reminiscent of Princess Peach's figure. I wouldn't mind them bringing her back, she's honestly cute as heck. And other characters were considered for the game but were ultimately cut, such as Sonic being a part of a rock band in the sound test mode. But they went unused to keep the story as a simple hero versus villain narrative. Yep, every hero needs a villain, and oh, that guy, he'll do. The team brought back that Teddy Roosevelt looking guy from earlier and moulded him into a more villainous role. I'll be honest, I do have a soft spot for his bee-like coloration here, but I do prefer the design they went with later. This egg-shaped doof would act as the arch-enemy of Sonic, replacing Thirteen as the main antagonist, and being the polar opposite of the hero's representation of freedom, being a guy all about constructing evil robots and machinery, and being the colour red to boot, <laughs> the two couldn't be more further apart. This villain, which represented industrialization and all things terrible, was eventually decided on being called Eggman. <laughs> Real creative, guys. But it worked! It's about as simplistic as his design. Sega of America would give him a different name in the marketing, due to how little info they had to go by from the Japanese material, giving him the full name of Dr. Ivo Robotnik, the word Ivo being an inverse of Ovi, meaning egg in Latin, and Robotnik meant to invoke Slavic Russia with its revolutionary vibes. This was all done without Sega of Japan's consent, by the by, and the name difference between regions would persist for years to come, though Sega of America would sneakily have Ivor Robotnik be the character's real name, while Eggman is just a name the villain took on after his shape. In Japan, the name Robotnik is largely ignored. Programmer Yuji Naka would work on the game's engine and make it way faster than anything he worked on previously. Fantasy Star, the Ghouls and Ghosts port, uh, Super Mario Bros, of which he was ironically a fan of. Nope, it was going to be fast paced. Jumping on board was supervisor turned level designer, Hirokazu Yusuhara, who would work on the level layout, and they created a game as colourful as it was accessible, having a visual style mildly influenced by pop artist Izin Suzuki. And though the team works 19 hours a day, Jesus Christ, the game would ultimately prove successful for the company, selling like a gajillion copies. It really speaks for itself, just a shame for the crunch these guys had to go through. That's enough on the development of the game, I suppose now it's good to, like, actually talk about the game now. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, and yes, I understand there's not much story but I shall still go over it and give the game a quick look through before going into its other aspects. So we saw the creation of Sonic, Eggman and the world they inhabit, let's see how they play out. Our story takes place on South Island, a landmass which unnaturally moves across the ocean. 
a paradise for nature, it houses many ruins and treasures, including the six Chaos Emeralds, colourful gemstones of immeasurable power hidden within natural distortions of the island. Enter Sonic the Hedgehog, a speedy blue fella who enjoys freedom and running around all carefree, who finds that the place has been visited by a one Dr. Ivo Robotnik, who had trapped the little animal friends within imposing prisons and hostile robot minions, uh, named Badniks, all in his bid to seek out the Chaos Emeralds and use their power for his evil, polluting ambitions. On his quick detour to stop the villain, Sonic traverses across the island's various landscapes, tussling with Badniks and Dr. Robotnik repeatedly. There are seven zones in total. Green Hill Zone, a lush, watery habitat with the famous checkerboard soil which became something of a recurring motif in every game afterwards. Marble Zone, a volcanic area rife with lava and underground ruins, and lots of spiky chandeliers. Spring Yard Zone, a sparkling cityscape slash theme park under an evening sun, and introducing bumpers to the series. Labyrinth Zone, a sprawling underwater cavern which houses the game's dreaded underwater sections. Starlight Zone, another city set at midnight with emerald green highways stretching across the skyline. And Scrap Brain Zone, Dr. Robotnik's polluted nightmare of a base with traps around every corner. This zone's third act takes place in a grayscale version of Labyrinth Zone but with gross pink water, and it leads into Final Zone, where the final battle takes place. Here, Sonic kicks the good Doctor off the island and brings peace to the world, with a slightly different variant of an ending depending on if you collect all six Chaos Emeralds or not. Like I said, it's a very basic story, but it fits well for what it is, a simple hero versus villain narrative. The player character, Sonic, is very much an angry little dog. I adore the expressions and gestures in his sprite work, from the way he scowls at you impatiently while idle, to his goofy face when teetering on the edge of platforms, the way he curls into a hedgehoggy bull when you look down, to the freaked out death pose when he gets yeeted off screen. This little guy has some range in his cartoonish design, and you can really see the uh, rebellious streak the developers implemented in his various frames of animation. And trust me, for the time, you never saw many expressive quirks such as these during gameplay, uh, not counting death animations anyway. <laughs> Any character can just die. Every zone has its fair share of enemies, some spread throughout the different environments, and some resigns to only one of them. The badneck designs in this game are simple, but easily convey that they are a threat. Even with 16-bit graphics, they easily convey that they are robotic in nature, either by the details of some metallic latches or a wheel, or the big googly eyes strapped onto them. The different types of badniks in the game are as follows. Motobugs appear in Green Hill and are the weakest of the bunch, generally just rolling forward and sluggishly turning back around at cliffs. Very much the Goomba of the game, but smarter. Buzz Bombers quickly fly horizontally and only stop to fire a projectile. They appear in Green Hill, Marble and Spring Yard Zone. Choppers are piranhas which leap up from below bridges. They only appear in Green Hill Zone. Crab Meat, these googly eye guys. They shoot glowy balls from their pincers, and I used to think the hole their eyes come out of was their mouth. Neutrons come in two flavours. Green and yellow ones phase in and out of the background and shoot projectiles out of their mouths. And red and blue ones do the same, but they follow you in a rocket form. They are both located in Green Hill Zone. Bat brains are robotic bats that hang from the ceiling and swoop down at you. They only appear in Marble Zone. Caterkiller, metal name right there, is a segmented robot with spikes on every part except its head. They appear in Marble and Scrap Brain Zone. Spikes, not to be confused with spikes, are hermit crab bots with sharp spines on their shells. Their sides are their weak points, and they appear in Spring Yard Zone. Rollers, armadillo bots, roll down slopes behind Sonic and attempt to beat him at his own game. They only appear in Spring Yard Zone. Orobots have drills for faces, and they leap out of the ground to ambush you, but can be identified by their drills sticking out of the ground. They appear in Labyrinth Zone and the third act of Scrap Brain Zone. Jaws are scary looking, but are really only a hazard if you happen to fall on one underwater. They appear in Labyrinth Zone and the third act of Scrap Brain Zone. Orbinauts come in two types, named Unidasu and Uni Uni in their original localization. <laughs> Love these goobers. Blue ones turn red and send their spiked balls at you horizontally, and they appear in Labyrinth and, you guessed it, Act 3 of Scrap Brain Zones. Green ones always have their spike balls around them, and are otherwise invincible unless you jump on them while still flashing or while invincible. They appear in Starlight Zone. 
Bombs are walking bombs that sluggishly move around, lighting their fuses and exploding into projectiles when threatened. They are located in Starlight and Scrap Brain Zone. And finally, Bullhog, pig robots that drop a bouncing bomb down slopes and not much else. They only appear in Scrap Brain Zone. Other characters, though they are very much relegated to the background, are the animals. Little critters that appear when badniks blow up in a puff of smoke, when Sonic frees them from end of level capsules, and show up in the ending cutscene in droves. While all unique in design from one another and appearing depending on the zone, they don't have much gameplay purpose and are really just there to show the cute animals being freed thanks to your heroics. Their original Japanese names are <clears throat> Kaki, Flicky, returning from the Mega Drive port of the same name, Pecky, Picky, Pocky, Ricky, and Rocky. I bring this up because the American localization, after changing Eggman's name to Dr. Robotnik, also felt the need to rename most of these critters as well, possibly because Cucky would sound really freaking weird to say. These names will be changed to, and tell me if you've heard these before, Sally Acorn, Johnny Lightfoot, Joe Sushi, Tux, Chirps, and Porker Lewis. All of these names and species going on to inspire well-known characters in the Sonic Saturday M cartoon and Fleetway's Sonic the Comic series. That's pretty hecking cool. Dr. Robotnik, or Eggman, or as I sometimes call him, Fishface, appears at the end of Act 3 for every zone, not counting the second to last one. <laughs> Acting more as a general menace, he obstructs your progress in his floating pod, the Eggmobile, with a deadly gadget attached to it. Sometimes it's a checker wrecker ball on a chain, a now iconic boss visual for the series. Sometimes it's a spike, at one time he just lets the surrounding obstacles attack you, and one time in a crusher room, the only one not fought in the pod. While the game has no character dialogue, Robotnik's facial animations can change for a small period of time to reflect his current mood. If you get injured, he giggles at the camera. If you land a hit on him, he grimaces while in a flashing damage effect. And when his mech gets destroyed and falls apart, his skin and moustache humorously turn a shade of crimson out of anger. He also appears in person in the last zone and <laughs> exudes a silly but still threatening personality. He's a very goofy villain amongst a cast that mostly consists of fluffy animals. In game, Sonic the Hedgehog can attack by spin jumping at enemies or by rolling into a ball while walking. It's always fun doing that, especially at the mildly high speeds of which you can run in some zones. The level design is often made with speed in mind, with more than a couple of loop-de-loops, curved terrain and ramps. Not all zones are speed based however, <laughs> most of them as a matter of fact require a lot of patience and are rather slow paced. Running with reckless abandon is usually a quick way to losing a life, but that could just be the way I play, I'm usually more methodological when it comes to games, otherwise it's gotta go slow. The level design is wild but fun to traverse through. I did notice a couple of repeating layouts between acts, but there's always secret passages hidden throughout when you hug walls, and a lot of different routes you can take to get to the big old goalpost at the end, an iconic staple with Robotnik's smiling mug that is flipped around to show Sonic's cheerful face instead. If you feel the need to look around, or make Sonic's head bob to the music like I do, you can also look up and down in the game, which isn't too useful unless you're in a more vertical area and you don't want to be hit by any off-screen enemies. And the delay between the player input and the screen moving makes the thrilling gameplay screech to a halt. Recurring obstacles include scary looking spikes, some there in the open, some alternating in and out of the scenery, and some attached to swinging maces. I'm uncertain if they are Eggman traps or just a natural part of Sonic's world. There are also springs, rubbery objects which propel Sonic into the air, across gaps, or just act as a nuisance. Yellow ones are more lax in the distance they launch you, but the red ones send you flying into fricking orbit if you're not careful, or into lava. God damn it. Helpful items include monitors, these 80s television sets which are literally made to be smashed. They can contain blue shields that allow Sonic to take an additional hit, one-ups to give you an extra life in the form of Sonic's chibi little head, fast boots which make you run at ludicrous speeds for a few seconds, bunches of 10 rings, and an invincibility power-up that surrounds Sonic in seizure-inducing sparkles for a couple of seconds as you mow your way through enemies, though you can still die from crushing platforms and drowning. A fun little real-life homes tidbit, uh, me and my cousin used to call this power-up magic dust. We were very weird and very autistic. <laughs> Speaking of rings, all throughout the game are these gold rings hovering above the ground and generally guiding the player in the right direction. 
Having them in your possession is key to surviving, as whenever you get hit by an obstacle, you drop all of them in total shock, scattering them all over the terrain before they vanish completely. It's quite infuriating when you lose so many and see Sonic just explode rings out of him. Me too, buddy. But at least it gives you an opportunity to pick them up and keep the adventure going, as well as give you a few moments of invulnerability. You die and lose a life if you get hurt without any rings, so as long as you have at least one in your possession, you'll be a-okay. You get an extra life if you collect 100 of them, which gets increasingly hard in later stages where obstacles and spiky balls are plentiful. Throughout the stage there are star posts, which make a little ding-dong noise, and are the things that you'll respawn to after you die. As well as a signpost, at the end of every act there's invisible points that can be collided with to add to your score, although it's totally superfluous, and if you have 50 rings upon reaching it, a giant ring will be there with which Sonic can jump into. Here you enter the Special Zone, a trippy dimension where the Chaos Emeralds are held in crystal barriers. They are tricky to reach, requiring you to memorise all these rotating, uh, psychedelic maps and the various obstacles within, including those annoying bumpers. If you collide with a goal button, you are ejected from the zone and continue the game where you left off. There's not really any achievement to collecting these glorified jelly beans. The only thing that changes is new plants popping up in the ending cutscene and Robotnik stomping in frustration on the end screen, instead of tauntingly juggling any Chaos Emerald you hadn't collected. You know, seeing this fat man mug off at the player makes me really want to discuss how the game looks, so I will cover that next. Ah, look at this title screen. Nice and simple, with the added flourish of Sonic popping in through a winged ring and wagging his finger in a crude manner. He's got attitude, alright. It's important to note that Sonic the Hedgehog was one of the better looking games on the Mega Drive at the time, primarily through its backgrounds and the different particle effects. Games such as Outed Beast's port weren't handled very well, and the character animations were relatively stiff and limited there. But here, we get more than two frames of animation for both characters and background objects. The flowers in Green Hill Zone and the neon lights in Spring Yard Zone coming to mind. The game employed the use of parallax scrolling, a technique where certain parts of the background move horizontally at different speeds to give the illusion of distance. While this was used in other Mega Drive games, and it's pretty easy to find the seams in which the parts are separated, there's no denying that this was very impressive in the early 90s. I especially love it in Starlight Zone, where they add objects in the foreground too. Things like this really helped make the graphics pop, not to mention the vivid colours in Special Zone, along with their neat screen rotating effects and morphing animals in the background. One effect I think goes underappreciated is the title card for each act, filling the screen with darkness and giving you only a name to go by, while the music kicks in and gives way to the lush locales. It really makes you sit in anticipation for what the next zone is going to look like. Future games would have more than just darkness and one primary colour, but it's worth pointing out as a visual experience. There's also details that were lost in the advent of modern technology, such as the waterfalls in Green Hill Zone, the game's shield, and the shimmering effect on the water's surface in Labyrinth Zone. While the last two were fixed to just be one slightly transparent layer, the waterfalls are a different story. No matter the 2D game, they always appear as blue columns two pixels apart to give the illusion of transparent water, but on televisions in the 90s, that effect had additional depth and colour. It was good for its time, and it was sadly lost. <laughs> Another is the effect when the screen fades in and out of black in level transitions, which I was dearly missing when playing the Sonic Origins re-release. On the original Mega Drive, there was a subtle darkening effect, where the game's colour palette would lean towards a dark blue before finally settling on an inky black. It's very minor, but it's a shame that they didn't emulate this in ports. Being a launch title for the Sega Mega Drive, the audio quality isn't that bad, though maybe a little standard compared to future games on the console. The sound bites used throughout are sharp and invigorating, be it from the player or just general sound effects like the satisfying collecting of rings. The way they overlap when you collect them is gratifying. Makes you feel rich just listening to it. Other significant sounds include the ding dong of a star post, the cartoony boing upon breaking open a badnik or monitor, the crunchy crumbling sound when the floor falls apart below your feet, the bizarre wow when you get a shield, the murky sploosh when fireballs appear as obstacles, the ominous timer when your air is silently counting down in Labyrinth Zone, the chaotic ping sound of bumpers in Spring Yard Zone, the dumbfounded fart noise when you lose a life, and the beewink when you enter a giant ring, signifying your entry into the Special Zone. 
Notably, this game doesn't have too many audibly grating sound effects like other games did with their particular twang sounding noises that had persisted since the Macintosh era of computer games. It's all the more better for it really, though the saw blade sound is rightfully shrill. What the crap, that thing just chased me! For the soundtrack, a Sonic Team commissioned a one Masato Nakamura, songwriter and bassist of the J-pop band Dreams Come True. I pity the guy. Understandably, it was tricky due to the Mega Drive being limited by the number of sounds that can play at a time, and the instruments themselves are much more rudimentary than real ones. Nonetheless, his music for Sonic stands out and has quite the range, making for a pretty robust soundtrack. And all of it was composed by this guy, from the level themes, to the end of level jingle, to the dreaded drowning music that foreshadows your inevitable underwater demise. That was close. Since I can count the number of music tracks in this game on my freaking fingers, I shall cut the background music, kick up a chair, and talk about every track individually like the freaking Sonic nerd that I am. The game's main theme is pretty iconic, used on the title screen, when you get invincibility, and with a special rendition in the ending cutscene and credits. It's also used in the little game over jingle, but <laughs> I never heard it that much. I'm a pro gamer! It's so synonymous with the classic era that not only would it be reused for a couple more games in the future, but it even made it in the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. <laughs> Food for thought. Green Hill Zone's theme, probably the most iconic and reused theme in anything Sonic related, has a bouncy, cheerful beat, perfect for encouraging you onward as you take in the 16-bit sights. It's good, and rightfully deserves its legacy of being remixed over and over again, though I can't say the same for the zone itself. Marble Zone's track is a much more mellow tune, almost bordering on threatening, but it still sounds adventurous, like you're digging your way out of a cave towards the welcoming light. Hearing this while passing darkened cells underground was a trip for baby homes. Spring Yard Zone is a more bumpy and pop-inspired tune, very appropriate for the maze-like cityscape you wander through. It's not one of my favourites, and it can be a little annoying, but it's not bad. You really get sick of the game's drumbeat soundbite after a while. Labyrinth Zone. My word, Labyrinth Zone. The level may be a claustrophobic subterranean nightmare, but boy does the music slap. It's got an upbeat melody that's more of an earworm than even Green Hills, as if encouraging you through an otherwise treacherous terrain. It's the one redeeming factor of the zone, except for maybe the cheese blocks. Starlight Zone's tune, by contrast, is a peaceful track with a slow, calm beat. The music complements the midnight sky locale very well. The instrumentation isn't exactly to my liking, but I can see why people like it. I enjoy piano remixes of it myself. Scrap Brain Zone has a tune that oozes finality. It's got a good build-up and an ominous, almost sci-fi sounding backing track, as if it were calculating to be the most efficient fortress music ever. It's more fitting in the mechanical stronghold than it is when Sonic is flushed into the frickin' toilet. Special Zone's music is as delightfully whimsical as it is distant and sombre, like a sonnet written for all of the Chaos Emeralds that are barely out of your reach. Like with other tracks, the song fits well with the general vibe of the zone, especially when you're pulling your hair out trying to escape those stupid goal orbs. The music when you confront Dr. Robotnik is super menacing. The sudden shift from Green Hills to the boss music is almost like a tonal jump scare. My only problem is that it's pretty short, and loops fairly often. The Final Zones theme builds off of the boss one by including more ominous instruments, adding a climactic tone to the whole thing. Really makes you think this is the final showdown after all the crap he gave you throughout the game. Did I miss any out? Oh yeah, the credits theme is also nice, and good to listen to after beating the whole game, giving you familiar tunes whilst playing demos of the zones you had travelled through. It's like it's showcasing all of Sonic's best moments, even if he does collide with things weirdly. Since Sonic the Hedgehog's release, there has been a heavy ROM hack scene, and there always will be because Sega encourages it, which is honestly refreshing to see in this day and age. Sega really do what Nintendo don't. Sonic the Hedgehog Mega Mix was probably one of the first ROM hacks, but there has been many others, from full zone conversions, ones incorporating unused elements like rolling checkables and the scrapped rabbit enemy Splats, to including whole new playable characters, even those from other Sonic media. There's been countless ones over the years, far too many to count in this video, so please don't ask. But things like this really show just how creative the Sonic fanbase can be, and how obsessed we are over unused content. 
The game has received multiple ports and re-releases over the years, but I'll only talk about the more notable ones. As of this video's release, it had several on the Mega Drive in the mid to late 90s, packed with other games to help promote them during the console wars. An arcade version which had most stages and zones axed to give the players a more archaic, streamlined experience. It was one of the games playable in Sonic Jam for the Sega Saturn in 1997. This one came with a Spin Dash feature that future games introduced. Sonic Mega Collection and its additions during the early 2000s. I personally enjoyed them a lot for their interface and menu music alone. A beyond infamous Game Boy Advance port which had the Spin Dash move but was cursed with slowdown and screen crunch. A playable version was included in the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 versions of Sonic Generations, emulated from the Sonic Jam version, but it was omitted in the PC version to make the game run better. The iOS re-release developed by Christian Whitehead and Headcanon. Now this one is special. Since it was done by people who did ROM hacks back in the day, these guys knew what to do and gave the option to play as Miles Tails Prower and Knuckles the Echidna. One for Sega Ages, Sonic the Hedgehog for the Nintendo Switch. This one had new modes and the option to use the drop dash from Sonic Mania. The Sonic Origins port, which used the iOS one and had pretty much all of the new features already mentioned, including widescreen support. And finally Sonic Origins Plus, which added Amy Rose as a playable character. Man, with this many ports, this sure sounds like a well-played game. And that's the first Sonic game. It's fair to say that the original holds up well over the years, even if future games improve on nearly all of its elements. It's not super great, and when playing it can get pretty damn frustrating at parts, but the hallmarks were there and it led to the Sonic franchise being a thing, which I can't help but be thankful for, even for all the hair loss. Many if not all of the problems I had or things I was unsatisfied with get fixed the more into the classic series we go, but I'd certainly recommend this game if you ever want to relive the nostalgia like me. It's available on pretty much anything now since Sonic went multi-platform. And thank you for watching this video up to this point. I'm still getting the hang of making Longman content and geeking out for just the right amount of time, but please let me know what you think in the comments. I appreciate any and all criticism thrown my way. <laughs> Give it to me real hard. I've survived Labyrinth Zone back in the day. I should be fine. When I make another one of these videos, it will probably be a smaller one on the 8-bit um, Sonic the Hedgehog title for the Game Gear, as that came out next. So look out for that and my Sonic comic review if I actually finish it yet. Thank you ever so much for watching, if indeed you still are, and... Gotta go fast!